Hey, Pastor Kyle here. I just want to thank you for clicking and checking out this resource. Hey, do me a favor. If you want to keep updated with all of our live videos, Sunday morning live streams, or any other video, just click the subscribe button so you'll get notified when we go live each week. Also, if you would like to give or find out more about the ministry at Crossview Church, you can check out some of the links below the video and click there to learn more. Well, I pray that this video and this lesson be a blessing to you. I pray for your week and, and may God bless you and keep you. You know, nowadays, um, most organizations have um, mission statements. They have these uh, one sentence or a couple sentences that sort of describes their primary goals as an organization, and um, there's several of them, and I'm just going to, let's, let's see if we can guess maybe a few of these. I've, I've got a couple to read to you. So here's the first one. Tell me if you th can think of who this is. We save people money so they can live better. No, it's not the government. <laughs> Sorry, that was a cheap shot. That's Walmart. Good job. Walmart. Very good. All right. Here, how about this one? We prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. That is the Red Cross, two for two in the front. All right. How about this one? Our mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Ooh, if, who thinks Nike? Who thinks New Balance? I heard two. It's Nike. Good job. Okay, how about this one? This is the last one. Let's check this one. Awakening people to life in Jesus Christ. That's Crossview Church. All right, very good. You are here and awake this morning. If you didn't know the answer to that one, I want to just invite you to our What We Believe class. Yes, that's a shameless plug. Shameless plug. No, there are many mission statements, and mission statements do help to give an organization some kind of an identity to help them know what direction they're trying to head in. So let me ask you this this morning. What do you think would have been Jesus' mission statement? When he walked the earth 2,000 years ago, what do you think he could have used? Is there any particular verse that comes to mind when you think that describes Jesus' mission statement? I think he summed it up well in Luke chapter 19, Verse 10, he said this, The Son of Man has come to what? Seek and save the lost. I think this was Jesus' mission statement when he was on earth. He came to seek and to save the lost. And this idea comes up several places throughout the scriptures, uh, even going back to the Old Testament, just a couple examples here maybe. Um, Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 36 says, I will seek the lost... Bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. In uh, Luke chapter 4, Jesus uh, walks into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he picks up from a scroll and reads from it. It happens to be Isaiah 61, but this is recorded in the New Testament in Luke chapter 4, and it says, as Jesus reads it, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I think this describes Jesus' mission perfectly, that he came to seek and to save the lost. Now, you would think that that kind of a mission statement would be well-received by everybody. I think we all well-receive Walmart's mission statement to save us money so we can live better lives. Amen. But Jesus' mission statement wasn't received well, or at least the actions that he did to carry out that mission were not received well. Now, you might ask, who on earth could think that a mission statement like seeking and saving the lost would be bad? Who would be opposed to that kind of a mission statement? Well, I'll tell you who would be opposed. Anybody who thinks they don't need any saving. A person who thinks I can do it on my own. I don't need anybody to come rescue me. I don't need anybody's help. That kind of person is the kind of person who would look at Jesus' mission and think it was maybe ridiculous. This describes the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were self-righteous people who thought that through their own works, through their own actions, through their own behaviors, they could achieve 
salvation. They could achieve it without a Savior. And so they did not like Jesus' mission, but they went beyond that. It wasn't just that they didn't like Jesus' mission. They actively opposed his mission. They did not want him to be reaching out to seek and save the lost. They didn't want him even associating with the lost people. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today. These are three uh, very familiar parables that Jesus tells. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open to Luke chapter 15. But in the first couple verses of Luke 15, we're given a little picture of what the scribes and Pharisees were doing while Jesus is trying to carry out his mission. The first two verses here in Luke 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. That is, they were coming near to Jesus. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now that word grumble there, that's probably an understatement. These people, they were uh, murmuring, they were complaining, they were, they were giving their uh, negative thoughts to anyone who would listen. They were frustrated and did not like Jesus' mission. Have you ever worked with someone or been around someone who uh, is murmuring and grumbling, complaining, maybe on a, on a team or at work, or you're trying to get a job done? Maybe, maybe even it's a difficult job, and you're, you're all frustrated, but there's always that one person on the team who, rather than just you know putting their head down and, and working or focusing on what needs to get done, they just want to complain the whole time. That is an absolute nightmare to be around. I think that's what is being said here when he says that they were grumbling. I think it goes beyond simply uh, issuing a complaint. I think they were bothersome with their complaint, so much so that they could be heard by others. Now, Jesus had already addressed the gr these grumbling complainers once because they were asking the same questions earlier. In Luke chapter 5, they're asking, why does this man, why, and they're talking to his disciples, why does your uh, leader, why is Jesus eating with sinners and tax collectors? Why is he inviting them to even be around himself? And Jesus gives them a response at that point and says, look, it's not the healthy person who needs a physician. Who needs the physician? The sick. Jesus' point was, what's the point in, in being on earth and, and rescuing and seeking the lost if I can't be around those who are actually lost? I don't need to go after those who are righteous. I need to go after those who are sinners, who have turned from God. Those are the people that I'm here to go after. They're the ones I'm here to rescue. Not the healthy, but the sick. So this is really a repetitive thing that's happened. So this murmuring, this grumbling has happened before. It's happening again. And so here in Luke chapter 15, Jesus decides he's going to give them an answer through parable. Now, parables were basically short stories and what Jesus used them to do is connect real world or real life examples, things that they could relate to, and he connects it to ideas that they maybe can't relate to. He helps them to understand hard topics by giving them easy things that they can see, things that they could see either in the world around them, things that they, that they just knew by experience. And he's trying to explain spiritual truth through the parables. And he gives these three parables in Luke 15, and they are, they're three back to back to back. They're interconnected and interrelated. So before we go any further, let's turn and let's read in Luke chapter 15 um, from verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 24. So he said to them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the young son 
gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now I want to make just three observations about Jesus' ministry and his mission based on On these parables. And the first thing I want to see, or I want us to look at, is that Jesus values the lost. Now, each parable begins with something that is lost a sheep, a coin, and a son. Now, with a sheep. In an agricultural society like that of first century uh, Israel, uh, a sheep was a big deal. Not only was a sheep a source of income, but it was uh, treated like an animal that uh, belonged to the shepherd, and it was his responsibility. Or perhaps it was an under-shepherd who was caring for his master's sheep. And he had a sense of responsibility and a sense that the sheep belonged to him and was under his care. He didn't want to be shamed by losing his master's sheep, but he also didn't want to suffer the economic loss by losing his sheep. I mean, If one runs off and you say, oh, well, I guess it'll be okay, and then another runs off and then another, it could quickly spiral out of control. So the sheep were extremely important to the shepherd. Now, we we maybe not not have a a full understanding of, of the kind of care that a shepherd would have for a sheep, but I know many of you are pet owners and consider... Uh, if you have a dog, how much love we have for our dogs. There's, there's a running joke in our house that sometimes when we come home, uh, the first person that we give the most attention and love to happens to be the dog. You've probably done this if you have one where you walk in and you, you walk past your significant other. You say, hey, uh, good day. How do you say, come here, sweetie. Come over here. Hey, what's for dinner? We move to the dog because we love and care for our dogs. And if you are on the, um, the, there's a Grable Facebook page that is supposed to be, I think, about local events and things going on in the town. However, what I have found is that the Grable Facebook page is actually the Lost Animals page, where we share, and I can tell by the giggles that many of you also are on this page, we share pictures of lost animals that are uh, walking down the street, they're walking in another's yards. There's often some crude comments that have to go along with that. We care about our lost animals. You can see it when we put our lost cat, lost dog pictures on telephone poles. We search high and low for them. I think in that way we can relate to what the shepherd is doing to go after his lost sheep. But the second picture gives us a, or the second parable gives us a picture of a woman who has lost a silver coin and begins to search for it. Now, there are some different opinions over what exactly this coin represents. So on the one hand, this coin, which was a a drachma or uh, roughly equivalent to a Roman denarius, uh, is representative of approximately a single day's wage. Uh, Now, I don't know about you, but if I happen to lose a single day's wage, I'm probably a little bit frustrated. But especially considering the uh, poverty that was just widespread in the first century, to lose a day's wage could mean maybe not even eating that day. I'm I'm not going to have enough for food. I'm not going to have enough to put uh, food on the table. I don't have the resources. Um, We have many people who can relate because they're living now paycheck to paycheck. 
So if you lose a whole paycheck, you, you are potentially set, in, set up for a cat, catastrophic failure economically. Maybe can't pay your bills, and you're going to get behind. And then, and then just like with the sheep, if you lose one today and one tomorrow and then one next week, now it becomes a major, major problem. So just simple economics, to lose a day's pay was a big problem. But there's actually another story, and, and uh, this, regardless of whether this is the actual truth or not, doesn't make much of an import into whether the or what the value of the coin is, but I think it's interesting, so I'm going to share it with you. And I have a microphone, so I get to do that. There's a second uh, option that many commentators think, and that is that the silver coin was actually one of ten coins that would be part of a bridal headdress. It's it almost like uh, what married women would wear as a symbol of their marriage and their uh, being wed to a man. And to lose that coin would be to lose a major part of that bridal headdress, It'd be similar to what you might experience if you lost a wedding ring. Now, if you have a wedding ring like me, which was ordered from Amazon Prime and is only $15, because I tend to lose them, you might be able to say, well, you know, wedding rings come and go. It's not really that worth. But hear me out. A wedding ring is worth more than just the cost of the diamond. A wedding ring could be something that's been passed generation to generation. And so now it not only has value to you, but it has value to history throughout your family. But a wedding ring represents something to you. The value of wearing it says, I'm wed to someone. I'm I'm married, and this is my person, and and, and I wear this ring as a, a symbol of my love for my spouse. So to lose that would be heartbreaking, at least, but I know that you would probably spend a lot of time searching for it the value maybe would be innumerable. And of course, in the final example, in the third parable, we have the picture of a son, a lost son. Now, it probably goes without question what the value of a child is to us, but how many of you value your children and your grandchildren, or even your spiritual children, uh, your spiritual little brothers and sisters? How much value do we give to them? and to how much we love them and care for them. You know, when God looks upon you, even in your lost state, he doesn't just see a sinner who's turned away from him. When God looks upon you in your lost state, or when he looked upon you when you were lost, he didn't just see a sinner walking away from him or a wicked person. He saw a sheep. He saw a lost coin. He saw a lost child. You know, he made you in his image to be in relationship with him and to be near him. And if you need any proof or further proof of just how much God values lost people, you need to look no further than the cross. Romans 5.8 tells us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So how much does God value the lost? He's willing to send his only son to die on a cross, to offer forgiveness to the lost. You know, sometimes I'm asked, how is it possible that one man could pay for the sins of so many? I mean, at this point, you're thinking millions and billions of people who's, who's been, who have been saved through Christ's sacrifice. And, and the question is, how could one man do that? We need to understand something about Jesus. Jesus was infinitely valuable. And his shed blood is worth more than any numerical value you could ever estimate. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Friends, if you're lost today, if you've turned away from Christ, and you're still stuck in your sins, you know, it's not too late. His blood is worth enough to pay for every single sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future. And when we put our faith in Christ, he promises that his blood will pay the price for our sins, and we'll have forgiveness. We'll be washed clean and given a new life. And you can do that today. You can can turn to Christ today You can ask for forgiveness. You can pray to God and say, God, on on your son, because of what he did, because of the life that he lived and the way that he gave his life for me and the way that he offers to 
cover my sins, I can be forgiven. You're a graceful and loving and gracious and merciful God, and I want to trust in your son to give me forgiveness. But God doesn't just sit around either. He doesn't just sit and wait for us to come to that conclusion. God actually pursues us and searches for us. So I want to show you the second observation here is that Jesus searches for the lost. Now, we already pointed out that Jesus' mission statement was to seek and to save the lost. And this, this is the seeking part that we're looking at now. The shepherd goes out and leaves the 99 to find the one. Now, it is important to remember that in the first century, most of the time, a shepherd wasn't working completely alone. He wasn't solitary. Often there were other under shepherds with him. And so when a shepherd would leave the 99 to go search for the one, it's not like he's saying, I don't care about these ones anymore. I'm just going to care about that one. No, no, no. He left them under care of another under shepherd and he would go pursue the lost sheep. Now, to pursue a lost sheep was not just a walk in the park. To pursue a lost sheep, especially in the wilderness in ancient Israel, was a dangerous, dangerous endeavor. Do you guys remember King David? King David was, before he was anointed to become king, David was a shepherd boy, a shepherd in the field caring for a flock. And there's this scene where David's getting ready to confront Goliath. He's getting ready to volunteer himself to go out and face Goliath. Do you guys recall this story? In, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. But before he goes to face Goliath, Saul, who was the king at the time, tries to stop him by saying, listen, David, uh, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, what Saul maybe didn't understand about David was that he was courageous and brave, and he knew that he had God on his side because he had been anointed to become the king. So there's that. But there's also the very practical matter of the fact that David, in his shepherding days, had dealt with things that he judged to be even scarier than Goliath. Here's what David says in response. Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him. And rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. That's pretty gutsy. He's willing to go and deal with lions and bears. Now, I just want to point this out. This is a side note. Coincidentally, a study was done several years ago. And they were interviewing different people from different nations and trying to find out I know this is a strange question. How long do you think you could survive in a fight with a grizzly bear? This is the question. Uh, most European men said something like, oh, a couple seconds. Uh, even men from places where there are actually uh, seriously dangerous animals like Africa, even men from there said, oh, I don't know, maybe a few seconds. You know how long American men thought they could last against a grizzly bear? Most thought they could last over a minute against a grizzly bear. Friends, I've seen one bear in the wild from the safety of a Ford F-150, and I'm not gonna lie, I even rolled my window up just a little bit extra, just in case, to go after lions and bears to rescue a sheep. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't mention in his parable anything about uh, the shepherd having to fight uh, a lion or a bear to get a sheep back, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that if a sheep wanders off, because we know sheep are defenseless, somewhat dumb creatures, if a sheep wanders off on its own into the wilderness, it, is, it, it could be attacked and killed by a predator at any moment. It's just waiting. It's just a sitting target. And so for the shepherd to say, okay, I have to leave and go find the sheep, there's a good chance that he's not the only one hunting it down that he may actually come into contact with other predators or other animals that would do the sheep harm, which gives him even more reason to go after the sheep before it gets killed, right? But to pursue that sheep is a, is a dangerous job. It's not something to be taken lightly. And Jesus says to go after the one, willing to put his life, literally, as we know, put his life on the line. 
to rescue his sheep. And then the second parable we see in verse 8 that this woman who has lost the coin, she searches for it, she lights a lamp, she sweeps the house and searches carefully for the coin. She's going high to low, she's looking in the corners, the cracks, the crevices, everywhere. Now, I know I'm not the only one who when you read that verse, the first thing you picture in your mind is looking for the remote control in the living room. I'm telling you, when the remote control is lost, we are better than the Coast Guard. We're flipping the couch over. We're tossing couch cushions and pillows. We're looking in the strangest of places. We're like, why are you looking in the freezer for the remote? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just making sure. I want to cross off all the possibilities. We go searching in the house. Now, a remote control has no value, but a person, a lost person and the value of a lost person. Now, that's something we're searching for, I would even say that's something worth maybe risking our lives for. In the fire department, we have this saying, uh, risk a little, lose a little, risk a lot to save a lot. And the way we translated that was to mean, you know, if we show up at a building that is clearly going to collapse, there's no chance we're going to get anything out of this building, and the only thing that the person has left inside is their tangibles. Maybe, I'm like, I've got a MacBook Pro in there. Well, I, I understand that that's valuable to you, but we're not going to send people in to rescue a MacBook Pro. I'm, I know the TV remote is still in there somewhere. We're not going in after it. But if they say, listen, I have a child. I can't find my child. He may be in there still. Now we have reason to risk. We'll be willing to risk our own lives to try to rescue a child, not a remote. And Jesus says, the search is real. We'll light the lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully for the coin. But if you paid attention during the time where we were reading through the parables, you might be asking yourself this question, but what about the father? The father doesn't seem to be um, lighting a lamp. He doesn't seem to be searching. He doesn't run after his son. He doesn't chase him down to the distant land. He doesn't start asking questions. In verse 20, it says, he sees him a long way off and saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him. Listen, the father isn't just sitting around hoping that the son comes back. How many of you have adult children? If you have adult children who have maybe wandered from the faith, how many of you realize that sometimes the best way to search for your adult children is to make sure they know where to find you. If you've ever been lost in the woods uh, with, a, with a hiking group, and, and I, I go hiking quite frequently, and one of the things that I know is that sometimes you can get turned around in the woods. You can even get separated from one another. And one of the things that we always set up when we're uh, doing hikes where we could get, uh, you know, turned around uh, is, hey, what's going to be the rendezvous point? Where are we going to meet? if we end up lost and separated from one another. Now, usually it's just the campsite, right? Well, just if you get lost, meet back at the campsite. We know where that is. You can, you can find your way to a highway. You can flag someone down. You can search for the campsite. If you get lost, you can come back home. And sometimes the best way for us to search for our adult children, and we know how easy it is to rescue our adult children, right? I don't have adult children, but I've heard it's really simple. Okay, I'm lying. I haven't heard that it's simple. I know that it's complicated. But let me ask you a question. Do they know that you are waiting? Do they know that you are looking? That you're standing there and you're able to search out over a long distance so that if you happen to see them coming back, you're able to do what? Run to them, greet them, welcome them home, hug them, put the robe on them, kiss them, give them love, throw a celebratory feast for them. Sometimes the best way of looking is to remain in the place where we know we can be found and to search relentlessly with our eyes. But hear me, God is not bound by space or time. He's not bound by having to wait in one location because no matter where you go, no matter how far you wander away from God, no matter how far of a distance you think you've created between you and God, guess where he always is? Right there with you. 
As soon as you turn around, you don't have to travel back. There's no journey that you have to take in order to try to re-find God. In your lostness, in the pig slop where the lost son was, all he has to do is turn and say, God, please, this can't be real life. I need you. And God is right there. Now, I know some of us as uh, parents wish that we could have that kind of ability with our children so that if they're a long ways from us and they have that heartbreaking, heart-wrenching moment where they realize that they want to turn back to the faith or maybe where they, for the first time ever, want to give their life to Christ, that we would love to have the omniscience and ability to know that and then to just be there instantaneously to wrap them in our arms and give them all of our love. But the second best option is to make sure that they know that you love them, care for them, and desperately want them to turn to the Lord, but desperately want them to be in a close relationship with you and with God. And maybe today is just a simple application. Maybe today the simplest thing you could do is pick up the phone and make sure that that's really clear. Maybe you can do that. And you don't have to argue with them. You don't have to point out their lifestyle. But sometimes a child just needs to hear words from their parents like, I love you. Consider that today. God is on a relentless pursuit, his mission to seek and to save the lost. And when he finds you, and make no mistake, it's when he finds you. God is the initiator. He finds us. He's the one that pulls us out of the miry clay and sets our feet upon the rock. He's the one that... that brings our hearts and our minds to him when we're stuck in the slop with the pigs. It's, it's him that, that does that. It's his grace. It's his love. It's his abounding mercy that draws sinners to repentance. God's grace and mercy are amazing. And when a sinner repents, when a lost person is found, when the Lord Jesus picks you up like a sheep and and lays you on his shoulders and walks you back into the sheepfold. The joy is overwhelming. So the final observation I want to make, Jesus celebrates the lost being found. Verse 7 says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Verses 9 and 10, describing the celebration when the woman finds the coin. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Even just one sinner One person is cause for a heavenly celebration. Just one. And we can celebrate along with them every time we see even just one person turn away from their sins and begin walking in step with the Holy Spirit, rescued to live a a life focused on Christ, repented and trusted in Him and in His blood to offer them forgiveness. Even just one Now, Hal mentioned during the announcements that we are looking out about five or six weeks towards Easter. And we get excited for Easter because it gives us an easy opportunity to invite our friends, our neighbors, our extended family to worship with us on Easter Sunday. It's, It's one of the easiest days. I think Christmas, Easter, and by the way, Mother's Day is another one that is often easy. Moms hold a lot of power over their children on Mother's Day. It's incredible. It's amazing. But Easter Sunday gives us an opportunity to be praying for and pursuing our one. The one who we will celebrate when they trust in Christ, when they maybe turn from a backslidden state, or when they, when they walk back into the faith and trust what Jesus has done for them. Here's what's interesting. We say that Jesus' mission and even his mission statement is to seek and to save the lost. But he makes that, when we become Christians, he makes that our mission statement. In John 20, verse 21, he says, As the Father has sent me, I also send 
you. And he invites us to join in his process to seek and to save the lost. When we do this this thing we call the Who's Your One campaign. Not Who's Your One campaign. Anyone that's watched NCAA basketball knows you. There's no, nothing similar about Hoosiers in number one this year. Who's your one campaign? Who's the one person that you need to be praying for, praying with, praying over? Who's the one that you need to be inviting to hear the message of the gospel? We want to pray with you. You can fill out one of our prayer wall cards and ask us to pray along with you as a church family because we want to be pursuing even just the one sinner who needs to turn back to the Lord. Even just the one. Charles Spurgeon once said, I would sooner bring one sinner to Jesus than unravel all the mysteries of the divine word for salvation is the one thing we are to live for. For the next month, between now and Easter, let's make it our mission statement to reach for the one, to seek and save the lost. The lost one, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. This is what we live for. Let's pray. God, we thank you this morning that you sent your only son to come and rescue us a divine rescue mission to seek and save us when we were lost, to seek and save our friends and our neighbors who are still lost, our children, our family. God, we lift them up to you collectively this morning. The person that you brought to our minds when we thought about our one, that's the person, God, that we're lifting to you now. We're putting them back before you and asking that you would help us to seek them. Give us words, uh, wisdom, and knowledge. Give us uh, strength and courage to be able to share with them in both grace and truth and love how much we care for them and how desperately we want to see them turn to you. God, you are the one who initiates. You are the one who changes. You are the one who gives a person a sense of repentance to to even want to step out of their situation. We ask that you would work powerfully in the circumstances that our lost friends are walking in to give them a, a sense of direction back to you. God, we ask that you, you fill them with your wonderful, amazing grace and love and cause them to turn and in love give their life back to your son. And we know that you, when they do that, you will wash them free of their sins and cleanse them in your son's blood and in his mighty name. We pray these things to you, God.